Welcome back, everyone. So, uh, what a time, right? Large changes are afoot over at Blizzard Entertainment, but to be honest, I'm actually kind of worried that they will come at the expense of one of 2020's good bits of news, which of course is the Tony Hawk remaster. So, that's an iffy situation. There's also a whole bunch to dive into there because a lot of us suspect that there's a bit more of Activision's influence slipping in, and also Team Xbox temporarily lost their minds, which is quite interesting. Also, a uh, quick tease, here is the January Patreon loot. Big art changes to the style of our stuff and also the sword pin, which is, I think, pretty damn awesome. The links are, of course, below and that is, uh, well, the primary way that this channel um, is actually, you know, a thing. So, a big thank you to you and let's go. First, Blizzard. So, Activision Studio, Vicarious Visions, are being folded into Blizzard Entertainment entirely. Now, for a recap so you understand here, Vicarious Visions basically were legends of the early 2000s, particularly in the porting business. And that actually means that there's a very high chance that you have played and loved one of their releases. Now, in more recent years, they were more of a support team and a whole bunch of Activision stuff. That, of course, includes Call of Duty and Destiny 2, until, of course, Bungie left. Very recently, though, they are the remaster guys. They led Crash and Sane in Trilogy. They, of course, were Tony Hawk, Pro Skater 1 and 2 remaster. I mean, these games were amazingly good remasters. If, if they had a skill, I think, it would be creating different versions without losing the original's vision or passion. I think that's how you could encapsulate the remasters that they worked on. Now, though, they're just a part of Blizzard Entertainment, right? That means they're dedicated entirely to, well, existing Blizzard projects. This is honestly kind of tragic to those of us who loved their remasters. It really is, and, well, it's a bit of an end of an era, because this is a 31-year-old studio, and now... Well, they're kind of just slurped into Blizzard Entertainment. Now, on the Blizzard side, though, this could be a sort of hopeful 200-man rescue mission. Blizzard's output has been, I think, shockingly low for the resources they seem to have overall, and not many of their initiatives have really helped out with that. I mean, we spent half of 2020 releasing videos about how Blizzard are continually losing their some of their best staff to greener pastures like Riot Games, and then the likes of Dreamhaven, which is a veritable Blizzard 2.0, founded by the president of Blizzard who had just left. World of Warcraft is doing very, very well. Absolutely. But that's basically all they've got going for them right now because Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4 are still just big old question marks on the horizon. Not to mention, their last release, Warcraft 3 Reforged, is unofficially the worst Blizzard game ever. It sucked. They need to be saved. Blizzard, that is, and I guess in this situation, um, who else but Vicarious Visions to try to do that? But this is not just an office full of good developers to use as they see fit. Our read here is that Activision is injecting, well, a bit more of their own into Blizzard Entertainment, into that other business unit. Maybe to write a sinking ship. I mean, keep in mind here, Vicarious Visions have been part of Activision since 2005. Right, that's three years before the Blizzard merger. So they're they're the old blood of Activision in many ways. In fact, their studio head has been in Activision since 2003. And after almost five years as a senior producer at Activision, she was assigned to Vicarious Visions, eventually becoming the studio head. She now has been promoted to the executive vice president of development at Blizzard. So she is Old school, Activision. She's now the VP of development at Blizzard, and she reports straight to J. Allen Brack, the current president. Now, this is purely speculation on our end, but it seems to me that this is more of Activision coming in there. Maybe it's just sort of saying, hey, Activision old blood who can get stuff done, go in there and show Blizzard how to get stuff done. It sort of feels like that with, you know, the studio head now being 
basically a VP of development at Blizz. While all of this is just happening right now, it actually won't be that long, we think, until we start to see the fruits of this new partnership. And we think the initial fruit is going to be Diablo 2 Remastered. So it's an open secret that it's been in the works, but uh, Jason Schreier all but confirms it himself and that it's also Vicarious Visions project. They have been working on this for at least a few months. The um, timing of this one, uh, you know, all of this happening one month before the online BlizzCon replacement, that's not lost than anyone. But all in all, I'd say this should be good news for Blizzard, because if you look at Vicarious, they're clearly a passionate and effective team who, when it came to remastering those titles, did an absolutely incredible job. They kept all of the passion and the joy in those games. They didn't poison them with unwanted modern editions. So if the Diablo 2 remaster is anything like Tony Hawk remaster, then we've got nothing to be afraid of. So that is a positive. It does beg one question, though. Why did they have to go to Vicarious Visions to remaster Diablo 2? What about the Blizzard Classic Games team? Well, according to Bloomberg, that team doesn't exist anymore. Because after a catastrophic release of Warcraft 3 Reforged and a grueling year, Team 1 was restructured. And that actually means that it was torn apart in October. This even included uh, staff having to re-interview for other positions, with some of those staff upon the re-interview actually being, uh, you know, dropped. Team 1 were responsible for Warcraft 3 Reforged, which you may think, oh wow, Team 1, they must suck. No, they also did Heroes of the Storm and Starcraft 2. And say what you want about Heroes of the Storm, I think a lot of that game is absolutely top-notch quality. It's just not necessarily the type of overarching design that would go up against a LoL or a Dota. But HOTS, great game. StarCraft II, beautiful game. And that all does explain StarCraft II support being dropped back in October, right? Team 1, gone it seems. It would be cliche to call this an end of an era since... I think the era of the Blizzard we all loved and could sort of just trust, well, the, that's, I think, gone. I mean, the main thing that I, I do in terms of, you know, like, viewers and all of that is, is our Warcraft channel. And even with me saying that, I no longer treat Blizzard the way that I did. I treat Blizzard just like any other large publisher. Because, frankly, they, they don't deserve any better treatment because of, well, I mean, how they do things. So, yeah. It does feel pretty damn miserable, to be honest, that Team One's legacy has came to such a bitter end, especially after just nailing it with StarCraft II, and now they're just kind of dead and gone. But maybe this is Blizzard just accepting that it's time to move on. And maybe there is some sort of new era where Blizzard is a bit more corporate, a bit more, you know, ship shape and stuff, but actually, um, you know, is able to ship product on time, which... Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, maybe we should just think about Dreamhaven and hope that it does well. I suppose it won't be that long until we find out a bit more though, because BlizzConline, as they so cheesily put it, is, uh, I believe, the 19th and 20th of February, so about a month from now. On the bright side, look, if Vicarious Visions can do for Diablo what they did for Tony Hawk and Crash, then I guess, uh, I mean, that project's not really in Blizzard's hands. And that actually might be a good thing, given how War 3 Reforged went. And on that, by the way, it's worth noting War 3 Reforged was not a big calamitous disaster because of the quality of Team 1 or anything like that. It absolutely seems to be the case that that was just humongous leadership, budget, and timeline failures that set that team up for a humongous failure. Because how the hell, in a timeline where Microsoft are doing a new Age of Empires and are doing their definitive edition of Age of Empires 2 that does super well, and all of this stuff is going really good, I mean, how the hell do you go and mess up Warcraft 3? Wow. It's an odd time for Blizzard. We'll just have to wait and see. But at least, pretty damn solid team are working on the D2 remaster. <laughs> We put the fan at the center of every decision we make. Moving over to Redmond, Xbox's leadership apparently lost their minds for a bit because out of the blue, they announced a significant bump in the Xbox Live Gold pricing, sort of following the steps of the likes of Netflix, I suppose, doing that little price bump. 
It's 2021, most of the world is in lockdown. We've all got subscription services to see them through the lockdown, so uh, I guess market leaders may as well try to get a bit more if they can, right? So the plan here was an extra $1 for those renewing monthly, or an extra $5 for the three-month sub. Now this would have brought the new proposed pricing to $10.99 for one month, $29.99 for three months, or $59.99 for six months. That's what a 12-month subscription used to cost. You might be thinking, what about that sub? Well, remember, they scrapped the 12-month option a while ago, and that led to a whole bunch of speculation. Now, that means that, uh, yeah, a year of Xbox Live Gold, that's went from 60 bucks to 120 for new customers. So that's rough. Or rather, it was going to be rough, because after an absolutely brutal 15 hours of backlash, they walked it back, and then some. They said this, We messed up today, and you were right to let us know. And when we said then some, well, that was a long-awaited fix. Xbox users, now that this big calamity has happened, they're no longer going to need to pay for Xbox Live Gold in order to play free-to-play games, right? That's a pretty big change from the past. Now, they said they're working to deliver this in the coming months, but, uh, I mean, look, it's one hell of a story. This is a company making an announcement, people disagreeing and giving them a big old slap for it, and then the company listening, and, uh, I mean, it's weird, because they, they took one step back in their initial mess-up, and then I suppose two steps forward, because not only did they just revert the bad thing they were going to do, but then they actually gave people a bit more. Surprising. I mean, the backlash was something else to behold, but I think it was clearly successful here. At least anecdotally, like, every big voice in the business who complained also made sure to highlight how Xbox is the only platform that makes you pay to play a free-to-play game. Basically saying that, you know, it's a $60 a year hidden cost for those who just happen to buy the console. And that that is something that hurts the value proposition, especially for families who just want to get an Xbox to, you know, let their kid go and play Fortnite. So Xbox were going to uh, raise that hidden cost to $120 a month just after releasing the Xbox Series S, the budget-conscious console that basically was there to capture market share. You can see, right? Get your market share, consolidate. Uh, you know, sort of increase those prices. So, yeah, I mean, they've, they've seen the error of their ways here. They promised to fix it. This is a win-win situation. So let's just hope for uh, hope for more of these and for consumers to continually be vigilant because it turns out sometimes when we are, good stuff happens. Finally, let's go over why they were going to make this change in the first place. It sounds harebrained at best and extremely out of touch, but it did have a point beyond just increasing margins. They were basically using it to push people towards Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, right, instead, because it includes gold, and has so, so many other things in it. That's basically it. Their plan was was obvious, I think, once they pulled the annual sub of Xbox Live Gold, and then put gold onto Game Pass Ultimate. Pretty much, they want you doing Game Pass Ultimate. It is as simple as that. So, make the Xbox Live Gold value proposition really not as, as good, which kind of makes Xbox, uh, you know, Game Pass Ultimate makes that a sort of a better looking deal, a better value proposition. Yeah, get people over there. So yes, gradually making one service worse to make the other one look better by comparison. I don't really think that's the best way to, um, to advertise how good your product is to customers. I mean, they've made it abundantly clear that their business model is reliant on Game Pass and getting people into the ecosystem. I think this change was obviously intended to incentivize people to spend just that little bit more for Game Pass Ultimate and then pretty much just stay there forever on that big Xbox subscription. And I think that is the core message here. Be it Disney+, Plus, be it Xbox Ultimate, whatever it is, big companies are coming in there. They're wanting to get you on those recurring revenue bundles. Remember that. Okay, that is it for me. I hope you enjoyed today's video. And I suppose speaking of a recurring revenue bundle, do you want to go and join in at ours? You'll get some pretty sweet Patreon loot like that sword in your post box. So you can check that out down below. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.